Welcome to week number two of a four-part series we're calling Stuck Together, and uh, I am super excited that my wife is joining me today. I'm excited to have you, and I love you. I, I wanna, love you. I want to tell everybody publicly how grateful I am for you. We wouldn't be where we are. 20, uh, working on our 21st year in marriage, everybody, and um, I love you very much. I love you, and... We missed Valentine's Day last week, so I told him on the way here, um, just humor me for a couple of minutes. I just want to tell you, say publicly some of the things I love about you. I love that uh, the way you lead this church, and I love the way that you serve, and uh, you're just, you lead by example, and I'm, I'm honored not only that you're my husband, but you're my pastor, and I love you. And then for funsies, I love the way you uh, load that dishwasher for me. <laughs> Take note, men. I love, I love the way sometimes you put the babies to bed. Ooh. I love the fact that um, many, many, many nights I've come home and uh, you'll, you'll have cleaned the house. It's just amazing. I, we are not perfect. Our marriage is not perfect. Right. Um, but I, I could not have asked for a better husband. And I mean that. You're, You're incredible. Sweet. Come on, girl. You. Let's get off this stage. Come on. So, hey, you can say I'm trained if you want to, but it's happy times at the Rose House. Some of you men could pay attention there. Load a little dishwasher. It'd be good times for you. Come on. <laughs> it ain't going to hurt you to load that dishwasher a little bit. Thank you. You're so sweet. And uh, I am excited. Thank you, Roy. That's If you keep playing slow jams, we may have to leave. So thank you for playing. I'm excited you're here today. Uh, this message, if you hadn't gathered yet, it's for couples. So if you have a child in the room, we're going to call today PG-13. Uh, I'd never do anything that would embarrass you, at least not on purpose. Um, and I certainly wouldn't do anything inappropriate. But uh, I think it's important that we talk about relationships from God's perspective. Here's what I've always said about church. If the world's going to talk about it, we ought to hear about it in God's house. Amen, everybody? Everything. You ought to hear about social issues. You ought to hear about uh, 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 how we overcome you know, the sin of racism and oppression. And, and you ought to hear about relationships. You ought, you ought to hear about all of it because we need to hear God's perspective. Not mine, not Brandy's, but God's. Say amen to that. And I want your kids to be raised in a church that gives them God's perspective because I promise you they're going to hear it from the world. I want them to hear it from God's word as well. Amen, everybody. And uh, we're so excited to bring you this message. This was our Valentine's message uh, that I was going to bring you last week. And then we were um, then we were online. And thank you to our team that pivoted so uh, well uh, to get us online so quickly in light of Snowpocalypse 21. Um, just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, you know, it snows a foot in Texas and no power, no water. And, and uh, I do want to tell you just really quickly... Um, that we're here for you and anything we can do to help you uh we're here for you if matter of fact today and i really do mean this I d don't let pride get in the way everyone at church online don't let pride get in the way if you need help tell us uh, we're here for you that's what the church is for amen everybody a better amen to everybody amen. let me go ahead and start teaching you it's not the government's job to take care of you god set up another kingdom on the earth to take care of people and it's us it's us. It's us. So our prayer is with you. And if we need uh, to help you, please let us do that. You, my staff's at Next Steps today after service. It'd be our honor to do that. Let me pray, and then we'll get into God's Word. Father, thank you today. God, help us to do a good job. Thank you for a chance uh, to open God's Word together, look at relationships together. God, I pray for healing today for some hurting relationships. Heal today where there may be strife or broken hearts or wounds that are exposed Today, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, uh, people would leave here changed and better and relationships would get better in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. 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 So uh, uh, somebody told me the other day, I, I'm, a, I'm a prophet when we titled this series. I'm, I'm not a prophet, uh, but uh, when we titled this series Stuck Together, because we've all been stuck together yet another week. Um, and there's nothing like being stuck in the house together. We were a couple of days without power and freezing and our kids. and Anybody else gets a 40 degrees in your living room. 
Yeah, forty. It's we were cold. we were at forty <laughs> degrees downstairs, so we lived upstairs, and it was just it was miserable. And uh, we're all kind of in the house together. And so today, I know you're going to think I'm a prophet. I'm really not. But um, uh, last week, I was going to bring you this message. And so I think it's probably more applicable today than it was last week. And I want to teach you today how to fight fair. Come on, everybody. I want to teach you how to fight fair. Would anybody tell the truth in church that you have argued with your spouse in the last, let's, let's give you two weeks, 14 days. Let me see all the real people in the room that have argued, Every, everyone wow. whose hands are not up are liars. Wow. So that's what they're dealing with. Wow. <laughs> I want to give you that. There you go. Thank you. Some of you are like, yeah, we're still fighting and I'm scared to raise my hand because <laughs> I'm scared she's going to hit me if I, if, I, if I say we're still fighting. I want to give you a chance uh, to, to, to hear from God's word about how to fight fair because conflict is inevitable. Amen, everybody. And I'm just going to be real honest with you. I told you sort of as we started this year off, I'm, I'm kind of on a mission to be very, very straightforward and kind of dig deep uh, into this year. I think we need that coming out of 2020. Uh, conflict has gotten so out of whack, everybody. We have gotten to the point where we can shame and guilt people. Uh, we've gotten to, uh, we've even created a name for what we do to each other and we've called it cancel culture and let me go ahead and go on record here and tell you unequivocally cancel culture is not kingdom culture Jesus didn't cancel you because you're a mess up and you don't cancel other people because they messed up say amen to that everybody and we're living in this culture that if you don't agree with everything I you know agree with or you're not you're not with me or you're not you know, we don't see eye to eye on everything, then, then you're out. You don't deserve a platform. You don't deserve to hear. You don't deserve to talk. You don't deserve, you know, maybe even your job or whatever. And, and it can bleed over into our marriages about how we fight. And, and you end up inadvertently treating your spouse like you would a stranger on the Internet. And, and you push them further away. And then uh, a year or two or months or so after that, you can't figure out why they're ready to leave you. And it's because, not because you're fighting, it's because of how you're fighting. It's not because of disagreements, it's because of how you disagree. Say amen. amen. It's not because you have conflict, it's because of how you have conflict. Because everybody fights. We fight. We fight. We, we fought on the way to church. Not today, but it's not happened. Today. It's happened. Our kids are with the grandparents today, so there was no fighting today on the way to church. But it happens, and it's real. And I think um, speaking to that a little bit in the way you fight, and he's going to give some more details, but I don't think it's just internally the way you fight with each other, but I think it's, it's the way you express your feelings about your spouse or your significant other yeah. to others. Um, when you say, I do, when you're loving that person, your mama, your daddy, your sister, your girlfriend, they're never going to love this person the way that you do. Right. So when you take your problems and you're, you know, they, they're driving me crazy or you'll never believe what they did. And you word vomit that to Facebook, Instagram, the world, whomever. You'll get over it. You'll forgive them, but they won't, right? So it's really, really important that we are not uh, just laying out every terrible thing. And that's not to say that you're not supposed to be honest. Uh, and, and, you know, we both encourage counseling. We have gone through counseling. Um, that There's no shame in counseling if, if you need it, get it. But that's in a private setting. I think it's super important that we are uh, encouraging and, and speaking our spouse up. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. We, have to, we, we have to point uh, their, the, the good things about them. They know what's wrong with them most of the time. Right. And I promise you their parents or their, their siblings or somebody in their life has told them what's wrong with them. That should not be our job to sit there and tell the whole world, look at their flaws, look what's wrong, right? We've got to, we've got to work really, really hard when we're fighting not to take that outward, but to keep that in the privacy of our marriage. Right. And get the help. I think I, I want to I get the help you need. Uh, I, I kind of grew up. Anybody grew up in church where all my churchy people at? Yeah, you're easy to spot. Um, <laughs> Where's all the heathens at? Where are all y'all at? So, yeah, you're easy to spot, too. I Where's all the heathens that grew up in church? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I, uh, I kind of grew up in church believing that counseling was a cop-out for spirituality. Look at my eyes. It's not. They're complementary. Yeah. 
you can be a Christian and still need counseling. You can be a Christian and still need medication to help you. I'm preaching better than you're writing or amening. And there's no shame. I have a counselor currently to deal with 2020, honestly. That's, I, I, you asked my wife. I called in the last quarter of last year and said, I've got to get some help. Uh, I've I got to process what I'm, what I'm going through. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would encourage you to get a Christian counselor. Matter of fact, we have some in our church that I recommend a ton of families and couples to. And then I have others that aren't in our church, in our area, that uh, you may need some help. So um, go, I, I think uh, I just I want to amen what you said, and that is go to the right people. Don't go to everybody. Because not everybody's got your best interest at heart. Amen? Not everybody's fighting for you. John Gottman of the Gottman Institute, if you've, if you've never heard of the Gottman Institute, sort of the premier... Uh, psychologist on marriage and relationships has studied for 40 plus years, actually in his 41st year at the Gottman Institute. And he, he said this about couples after 40 years of counseling couples, working with couples, uh, helping couples. He said, um, really quickly, our ushers, just make sure that there's pl plenty of room in the back as people come in. Um, he said that I can watch a couple fight for five minutes and I can tell you whether or not they're going to make it. After 40 years counseling couples, I can watch them, not watch them talk, not watch them communicate, not watch them cook together, not watch them, you know, with their kids. If I watch them fight, I know whether they can make it because how you fight matters. Right. Right. Conflict is inevitable, but how you fight matters. And not if you fight, how you fight. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple bonus scriptures to kind of start today. Not really our foundation scripture, just some bonuses. Uh, Proverbs 27 and 15 says it like this. This is in your Bible. A quarrelsome wife, Proverbs 27 15. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. That hits. That hits hard. <laughs> All you brothers are too scared to amen, but you want to. Some of y'all ain't amen. Ever a message in your life and you're writing that. Baby, write that down. I need to go study Proverbs 27. <laughs> a quarrelsome wife going home. Hey, I'm, listen, I got something for men. But women, listen to me. Look at me. You can't expect him to always want to come home if what he comes home to is worse than what he left at work and what he left in the office. And if it's, if it's whiny and, and complaining and nagging, and are you with me? Yeah. Okay. As, that, that's as in your a Bible. woman, as a woman, I want to speak to this because um, sometimes I'll, I'll look at scriptures and be like, why, why are you picking on us? But he, he kind of spoke earlier about cancel culture. And I, I have taken that on as a burden something in the last couple of years where um, man, menly, menly, manly Man. men have been attacked yeah. and um i think i think that there is a spirit behind what that scripture was talking about right. and uh women you have so much power in in how you speak and what you say to your spouse and you can destroy them with a sentence and you know that you know that to be true so it's so important that you think about and you and you develop the maturity and understand when they come in or when you're coming at them over a disagreement about something, take a deep breath and think about when I say this, what's it going to, where's it going to take us? Because you know where it's going to take you. And again, sometimes you want it to hurt, but ultimately if you want a strong marriage, you want something that's going to last, you, you have to grow up and get to the point where it's not about hurting them as hard as you can every time. It's, it's the maturity to understand that the long game is I still want to be married to this person 20 years from now. Right. So I can't say everything I think or, or everything that I want to say. I can't gripe about what we don't have all the time. I can't talk about what they have and we don't or what I wish you would do better. You've got to remember why you fell in love with them in the first place and, and fall in love with that again. Right. So good. So Proverbs 27, a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Let me give you, let me give you. A... It's good. It's fine. It's true. It's fine. But listen, man, I'm going to give you something. Write this down. Get, if you're not taking notes, write this down anyways. This is found in 2 Mitch Rose 4 and 2. Write this down. It is better to have severe hemorrhoids than to live with a husband who is a jerk. Amen. That's not in your Bible, but that's true. It is better to, to live with severe hemorrhoids than to have a husband who's always a jerk. So while we can talk about going home to a wife who's supportive, men, 
Your wives ought to come home to a man who is supportive and encouraging and uplifting and not degrading and not pulling you down and not comparing you to other women. Come on, everybody. They ought to come home to a man that loves them like Christ loved the church. That's right. Say amen to that. Amen. You can't come home a jerk either and expect an angel, right? You can't come home a jerk and expect an angel. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You can't be treated like a queen if you're not treating him like a king. I mean, right. it goes both ways, and, and that's really what we're here to talk to you right. about today. All right, so let me give you a foundation scripture that we'll work through today, and I'm going to give you some ways to fight fair. James, James is this practical book in the New Testament that uh, sort of gives you an outline of how to work out your faith. As a matter of fact, the most famous thing James is known for is that faith without works is dead, dead. You got to work it out. You got to work it out. And I, this is a spirit-filled church. I grew up in a spirit-filled church. And sometimes we believe you can pray it out and not work it out, but you got to do both. You can get a miracle from God in your relationship, but you may have to work on it as well. Amen, everybody? You got to work it out. So let me give you how to fight fair. James 1 and 19 says it like this. Everyone, shout everyone. Everyone should be quick to listen. Underline that in your Bible. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. Underline that in your Bible. And slow to become angry. Three things. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. And slow to become angry. Because a man's anger or a woman's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God wants you to have. In other words, fighting unfairly affects your spiritual life. You don't end up with a righteous life that the world is looking at. And, and, and we live in a culture, listen to me, that we're, I, don't want, I don't want my kids, my nine-year-old, my six-year-old kids, I don't want them to find a healthy marriage or what, what marriage is supposed to be in the world. I want them to find it in you. I want them to find it in their kids' ministry teachers. I want them to find it on the dream team. I want them to emulate your marriage and say, when I look for a spouse... I want it to be somebody like mom and dad have and somebody like my church family has. God wants to give you a righteous life in your relationship. Amen, everybody. Amen. And there's a way to do it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the way not to do it, then I'll end with how to do it today. All right, are you ready? Buckled up? All right, here, here's the first one. Four, four signs you aren't fighting fair. Four ways you aren't fighting fair. Number one is criticizing. If you're criticizing... Now, criticizing is different than complaining. Criticizing is about a personality. It's a global attack. A complaint is about a specific action that someone does. All right? So if you're fighting unfairly, if you're not doing it right, you are criticizing the total person more than just the individual thing. Sometimes this happens where... Uh, uh, will end up saying things like universally. So let me give you let me give you a good example. A complaint is there's no gas in your car, and I'm aggravated that every time I get in your car, it's empty and there is no gas. <laughs> I'm just using random examples the Lord gave me. A criticism is. I told you my gas tank was low. You never fill my gas tank up. Right. I can't rely on you to remember anything. Right. Ever. Did you catch it? <laughs> Listen, did you catch it? A, a complaint is about an action. A criticism is about you never. I can't count on you for anything. So be careful when you're fighting that you don't make the complaint about this thing. You didn't pick your clothes up. B, you're a slob and you never helped me around the house. Now that's criticism. Are you with me, everybody? How you, your language, matter of fact, most of this is about your language, by the way. So Absolutely. How you're fighting fair. If you're, if you're fighting unfair, the first thing is criticizing. i got to hurry. Number two, criticizing leads to the second one, which is contempt. If you're fighting unfair, contempt is next. I feel like this is the one where when we talk to couples, um, when they've hit this, yeah. it, it, we're in danger. Because this is when you get to where you're rolling your eyes, you're mocking them, you're going for the jugular, you know, well, your mom, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. Um, 
and and you just you can't get there. It's so so dangerous. Yeah. Um, it, it is. It's, it's the not communicate. Yeah, yeah, it's not communicating. It's it's whatever. Like I can't even deal with you right now. And when you stop talking, there's a wedge that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. So yeah, contempt comes up as nonverbal things. It's mocking them. <laughs> right. It's it's rolling your eyes. It's disgust. And listen, contempt doesn't really want reconciliation. Contempt just wants the fight to go on. <laughs> you, 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 none of y'all are married to anybody like that, but I've met other couples that used to come before COVID who would fight, and they didn't want the fight to end. If you don't want the fight to end, contempt is where you head because it never, never leads to reconciliation. It leads to the third thing. Write this down. I'm talking about how, four ways to know you're not fighting fair. It leads to the fourth thing, which is defensiveness. Defensiveness. Please don't elbow your partner. I'm just, I'm, I'm helping you sleep in your own bed tonight. <laughs> defensiveness. Defensiveness is, it's not me, it's you. It's, uh, you ignore the current situation and here, defensiveness usually comes up like this. Well, if you didn't, then I wouldn't, right? It's not responsibility for your own actions and the way you respond. It's, well, you know how to push my buttons, and you know that you know how I get when I'm hangry. And you come got me when I hadn't ate. And you make me do this. Are you with me, everybody? It's interesting. We were in a conversation um, this week with a couple um, still, still doing this in the freezing cold. And I know that that had aggravated things. But um, she was, blah, you know, and that's fine. That's what we're here for. But... Um, at the end of the conversation, we both looked at each other and said, he didn't say a word. (laughs) Like he didn't say a word. And it was all about everything he did wrong. And while we acknowledged that he had did, he had done some things wrong, she took no responsibility for that. And, um, and, and you're just sort of looking at them thinking you're in this, you're in this defensiveness stage that you refuse to take responsibility for anything. And you have to know if you're married, you're, you're one flesh and you know, uh, where one pulls, the other pulls. So y- you both have responsibility for right. how you fight. So criticism, instead of complaining, criticism leads to contempt, which is nonverbal. You're rolling your eyes. You're, you're mocking. You're, you're turning your back, which leads to defensiveness. I don't even, this isn't even about me. This is, you're, you're the one. And then, and then the final stage of not fighting fair leads to what we're calling stonewalling, stonewalling. Stonewalling and stonewalling is usually men. About eighty-five uh, percent of sto- stonewalling is done by men, and that's where you really just tune them out or shut them out. You know, you just the argument is going nowhere in your mind, and so you just you know you turn to your phone and you're done, or you turn the TV back on and you're done, or you get in the car and leave. I'm gone. Guilty. Or you're done. I know it's a lot of guys, but that's me. I I have the propensity to say what I want to say and then leave. So you can't really say anything back to me. Yeah. And that's, that's something we've worked through in 20 years that does yeah. not happen like it did early on because we, we learn these tools, but, um, you can't, that's not fair fighting guys. You can't unload, you know, this barrel at somebody and then get mad that they are not saying, you know, that they're not trying to fix it. You're not giving them an opportunity. Right. You shut down. It's so unhealthy. You have to make sure that there's a safe place and that there's room for them to express how they're feeling right. uh, back at you. If you're not communicating, it's not working. Right. If you're not communicating, let me give you some parenting tips. Uh, now, I'm not telling you we've solved any of this, by the way. Uh, I'm just giving you what after 21 years and, and what after, a, you know, a decade or so with kids. But um, if, you, if you're communicating, you can still work on it. If you stop communicating, it, you can't work on it anymore. So good. It's true. And so uh, it's true with your kids. As long as there's open communication, you can still be parenting. When, when they shut off, when they're stonewalling, then you're not, there's no more parenting. Right. And it's true in your relationships. When one person gets in the car and leaves for a day or two, I counseled someone who it's, you know, they're gone for days on end and I never see them. That wasn't I, me. I came back. No, she comes back. I didn't leave for days. <laughs> she just needs to ride around the block and cool off. But 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 that stonewall. But early on in our marriage, that's the way it went, you know. And it was and it was. And let me give you one worse than this. this is not in my notes, but let me tell you one worse than that. If your family lives close, and you go to mom's house, and you go to your sisters, because there you'll find somebody on your side, 
And I told you that jerk wasn't no good. I, t- I don't know why you married him. I hate that. I've been hating him. I don't know why you. I would get yeah, yeah. And then and now you're starting to forgive, and it's what Brandy said early on in the mer- uh, in the message. You're starting to forgive, and they're reminding you. And now it's not you and her working on your marriage. Now, now it's you, her, and your sister, and your aunt, and your mama telling you what you ought to do. Right, right. Are you still there, everybody? Stonewalling. So four ways not to fight fear. Criticizing. You know you're not fighting fear when you're criticizing. Not complaining, but criticizing. A global, you're, you're always, you're never. This always happens. When there's contempt, when you end up, you know, in this nonverbal posture of rolling your eyes, mocking them, turning your back. I just, I, I just I disgust with them. I can't even look at you. And then that contempt leads to defensiveness when you realize it's all you, it's not me. If you would change, if you would fix, and I wouldn't act this way. And then, and then stonewalling, four ways not to fight fair. Now let me give you three ways to fight fair. Let me give you the three rules, which is really our message today, to fight fair. Is this helping anybody? Let me give you three ways to fight fair. Number one, we're going to go back to our foundation scripture of James 1.19. James 1.19 says everyone should be quick to listen. I told you to write that down and underline that in your notes. Number one, if you want to fight fair, is stop to listen carefully. Stop to listen carefully. Now, this is where I struggle. Because when she's talking, I'm always thinking of what I'm saying next. Oh, oh, that, oh, that, oh, 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 I remember that. Oh, that's good. And I'm formulating my, anybody else? I'm formulating my comeback. We're five minutes into the argument, and he's like, but what you said a minute ago, and I'm like, I don't even care about that anymore. <laughs> I'm over here now. Just but I've me, been holding it. I mean, me I've been working on it. <laughs> I've been taking notes. Let me say my piece. Let me finish my thought, you know. So then I don't listen. So then I miss because I'm not listening carefully. A, a lot of times you, you don't hear what they're saying because you're thinking about what you're going to say next. You're thinking about how I want to say it. And this is, a, this is trouble for me. And this is, I think I told somebody the other day, I don't know if this is possible. There's got to be a smart, I, we have uh, therapists in the room. Uh, I don't know if you can develop ADD later in life, but I think I, I have. Um, I, I think I was pretty decent as a kid, but I, I really think I have. And so I end up I end up just, I think, you know, instead of being in this argument and listening to this, I'm thinking about something else. I'm already on this other thing. I'm, I'm already formulating Which what ladies, I'm doing. Which ladies, how many of you can say that is the worst thing? <laughs> Don't let me be going off and you're on your phone texting yeah. or, you know, I forgot my coffee or I'll be right back. No, no, like let's, let's focus. Like I need you to stay right. here, be in the moment, be present. Let's get through this, you know. Yeah, true story. We, we were in a discussion we weren't quite at argument level yet we were in a discussion and and I started engaging in a text conversation because I'm a very important man of God that needs people need me and um so I'm not (laughs) paying attention to my spouse and listening it's true story I said yes to some things I did not mean to say yes to I, said, I agreed with some stuff I didn't agree with. <laughs> Which I held him to. I held right. him to it. That's yeah. correct. Right. Because I'm not listening carefully. I'm not listening carefully. Proverbs 18 and 2. Write this in your notes. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding but delights in airing his own opinions. A fool finds no pleasure in hearing you. I just want you to hear what I... Oh, yeah. Oh, finish up because I got something to say. Is that, not our, fight fair, yeah, is that not our culture today? Right. You know, it, social media has given us that platform. Everybody needs to hear my opinion, and I'm not going to be quiet and listen and, and find understanding in where somebody else is coming from. Right. Yeah. So good. Let me give you a quick, let me give you a quick way to, to work. Let me teach you what they teach you in counseling, a simple concept to help you know you're listening well, and that's repeat back what your spouse has said to you so you know you're listening well. Uh, um, it forces you to listen. It validates your spouse that you're being that they're being heard. And you say something like this: uh, "I understand why you feel this way. I understand why you fill in the blank." So you're saying that when I do this, when I don't pick my draws up, it makes you feel this. Are you with me, everybody? Uh, if you'll say it back to them, and and it keeps the argument on point. We'll get to this in a moment. But sometimes this argument is not even about this argument. You decided, I'd like to argue about some stuff last week. I let go, <laughs> you know. 
And so when you repeat it back to them, it's active listening. And instead of grasping on to everything, you're listening. Come on, James says it, be quick to listen. Say amen to that. Amen. Be quick to listen. And, and Brandy is so right. This is good for your marriage, but it's good for our culture. Um, you don't know everything. You don't know the whole story. You only know the side of the people you're connected to. So be quick to listen. If you want to diffuse conflict in the world, you want to diffuse conflict in, in, in your family, not even your marriage, but just in your family relationships, or diffuse conflict on social media, talk less and listen more. Say amen to that, everybody. All right, number two. Be, be quick to listen. Number two. Guard your words faithfully. Guard your words faithfully. Again, James 1.19 says you should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Slow to speak. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Guard your words faithfully. This is where I struggle the most. And men, and when, Brandy said earlier that you have the power, uh, women and wives, uh, to give your husband strength or to tear him down. But the truth is, I know, I have, I have ruined the, the tenor and the culture of my home on a night in the first 30 seconds of walking in the door, Jeremy, of from just what I said. I compl I'm telling you from 5 o'clock till, till bedtime at 10, 11, 12 o'clock, I ruined the whole thing in 30 seconds because I, was, I wasn't slow to speak. I said something, out, oh my gosh, this place is a disaster. And I had no idea what she, she's homeschooling and with two children. And I, I just, I, I didn't know the story. Are you with me, everybody? Yes. You have the ability. Proverbs 21, 23. I told you that Proverbs is going to get you. Proverbs 21, 23. Watch your, I love this translation. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. <laughs> That's in your Bible. I didn't make that up. Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. Don't walk in thinking, I know what's going on. You don't have, everything that comes through your head doesn't have to come out of your mouth. That's a, good, that's a good rule for social media, by the way. Everything that comes through your head doesn't have to come out of your mouth or out of your fingers. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just doesn't have to happen. I, uh, we had two listed, but I, I'm adding a third one. Um, Three questions you ought to ask yourself when you're in an argument. Um, should it be said? Um, and should it be said now? And then I think the third one to add um, is what is my tone in saying it? Yeah. Um, it's so funny. I think the thing that I got in trouble for the most um, as a kid growing up, my dad said it a hundred million times, and now I repeat it to my children and to my husband. Um, it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. Right. So tone is everything. So, you know, um, do I need to say this, you know? Is it going to help the situation? Maybe I need to say it, but not right now. Right. Not, not when he's coming in, you know, after a really long day and he's stressed out. You know, we could talk about it later. But finally, and I, I would even maybe argue the most important is how you're saying it. Um, nothing will, will <laughs> like flare me up faster than the way I hear the tone of someone talking to me like what like you could uh you could say just about anything to me and I'll process it but if I hear an edge in the voice or a condescension or I, I'm we're done like let's go <laughs> you know so I think it's really important to think about do I need to say it do I need to say it now and how, how am I saying this if I'm going to speak this? Yeah, make, make sure some things are better discussed in non-conflict times. Write that down. Some things are better discussed in non-conflict times. It's just better sometimes that you don't, that this is not the right time, right? If you're fighting about money, don't mention having to spend Christmas at her mama's house, right? Not the right time. Are you with me, everybody? This is just not the right time. Some things are better. Don't, don't try to win every argument. Try to heal every argument. Don't try to win every argument. Try to heal every argument. The goal is healing, not winning. Amen to everybody. All right. First uh, Peter 3 and 8 says, Don't repay evil for evil. In other words, watch what you say. Don't repay evil for evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. 
because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. If you want to live in a blessed marriage, don't repay every insult with an insult. Guard your words faithfully. Let me give you some ground rules about what to say. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but uh, about what you should be saying during a fight. Number one, never call names. Never call names. Don't, don't, you're an idiot. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're, never call names. I, if, I, if I could tell you how many adults I counsel who are, are hearing the names they were called as children in their heads. Right. Never call names. Never raise your voice. Never raise your voice. <laughs> never raise your voice. You don't want your kids growing up. We decided early on. We didn't want our kids growing up in a house full of screaming and yelling. We just not going to do it. Now that may mean we talk forcefully in whispers. <laughs> but we're not going I'm not going my kids are not going to be scared of my tone. Never raise your voice. Never get historical. Not hysterical either. Not hysterical. <laughs> historical. historical. Never talk about well Oh, yeah? Well, but you, don't forget last month when you said and then you did. Oh, yeah? Well, a year ago you said and then you did and then, and then it was. And now we're not fighting about this. We're fighting about history. Are you with me? Yes. I want to hang on to that for a sec. Uh, we have a friend who, who they went through a, a tremendous um, restoration story in their marriage. And he said, um, you, can be a, you can be right or you can be alone. And that just has resonated with both of us sure. always. You, it might be fun to be right, but it's it's not fun to be alone. That's true. And so being historical, I think, is a huge, that's a huge statement to add to that. You cannot continually bring back their past. If you've agreed to forgive and to move on, it's not saying you don't have difficult days. It's not saying there aren't triggers or things that, that frustrate you or, or do that. But you can't keep continue to rehash right. that. You've forgiven it. God's forgiven it. We're moving on. That's the past. We're done. We're a new person. Absolutely right. Don't get historical. Never say never or always. Never say never or always. You never do this. You always do that. Never say never or always. I'm just giving you things what to, to use your words. Never threaten divorce. Threatening it is the step before doing it. When couples are threatening it, it's, uh, it's always a sign to me that, that you've already contemplated You've already got a plan. You've already thought about it. What would I do yesterday um, in, in conversation? What would I do? Not, I've already, already not done us. what I would do. Not us. <laughs> Someone we were talking we were to, with. yes. What would I do? I've already got a plan. And I think speaking to parents with um, married couples with kids, um, uh, let me tell you, m my parents are fantastic. I honor them. Um, they're amazing. But um, they were first generation um, coming, in, coming to God and getting in church. And we had, a, a, you know, there were some, some lots of yelling. Um, I can't ever recall them saying, saying that or threatening that or using that. And now as an adult looking back, uh, my parents have been married 40 years. Um, there is such a strength and a, um, a safety you give your kids yeah. when they know that just because things are tough, you know, is it going to happen? Are they going to split up over this, over this? Every time, if you're using that threat of divorce, so every time you're not getting your way or things aren't going your way. So good. Last one. I'm just giving you words to, to not say. Last one. Never quote your pastor during a fight. Never, <laughs> never. Leave, leave me out. Do not. Do not use me against them. Stop it. Don't do that. Number three, giving you ways to fight fair. Guard your words faithfully is number two. Number three, handle your anger righteously. Handle your anger righteously. I did not say don't be angry. Right. I said handle your anger righteously. Right. James 1.19 says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It doesn't say don't become angry. It just says how you get angry matters. There are some things in your life you are just going to have to learn to let, let it go. go. <laughs> let it go. Can't. I, I don't even know the rest of the song. It's all I know. Oh, you do. You know it. You know, Hold you know me it. back anymore. <laughs> Don't keep fighting for the sake of fighting. Some of you, I really believe, just like to fight. Just scrappy. You just like it. L look in my eyes. Your partner don't like it. Stop it. <laughs> and when they find someone who doesn't fight as much as you, the enemy knows yeah. I can use that against them. And now there's a wedge in your marriage and Absolutely. an opportunity for sin. Are you with me, everybody? Yes, sir. 
in your anger. Ephesians 4.26, you will get angry. Offense is going to come. Unmet expectations are going to happen. Men are going to be men. We do dumb things. We, we dry our hands on the towels that are there for decoration only. Why would you hang them so close to the sink? In your anger, do not sin. Ephesians 4. I just, <laughs> I just saw Megan pat Aubrey on his arm. That's so funny. I just want somebody else to suffer with me. <laughs> In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down. You've heard this a lot. I'm going to teach it to you today. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Because if you do, verse 27 happens. You will give the devil a foothold. If you let, now I don't know that it necessarily, I don't know that it really means sundown. But I do know if you let it last more than a day, the devil will let it last more than a week. And more than a year. I will say something that we've done. And um, sometimes our fight's not done at the end of the day. We're just tired. <laughs> we can't do it anymore. Um, something that we've adopted is when we're laying in bed together and we're aggravated or mad, we'll slide a foot over or a hand, and it's just a, hey, mm -hmm. like, we're going to be okay. Yeah. Like, I, I'm touching you even though it's, like, I don't burn, want to. It's burning my fingers right now. <laughs> you know, I think your skin's kind of weird and cold, but I want you to know, like, we're okay. And, yeah. you know, we'll pick it up tomorrow or, you know, we'll sleep on it. God will give us rest. We'll have a better attitude. It'll, we'll let it go in the morning and it won't be a thing anymore. But it's, it's a foot or a hand. I think that's just a practical tool, you know. Um, if, if you're still angry at night, you're just telling your partner, hey, I, I, I'm not leaving. You know, we're going to be okay. Right. And I, I think that's just something that um, we've adopted early. And yeah, I love sure. that. Not, if, if you literally don't let the sun go down, some of y'all may not sleep for five <laughs> or six days. You know what I mean? Like, Because <laughs> some of you got weeks worth of anger. <laughs> But I've always found my heart softens as the night goes on. My heart softens as the night. Be sure to work through it or you give the, 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 the devil the foothold. Don't, don't react in emotion. Respond in the spirit. Romans 12 and 21 says, Do not over, don't, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's, just, there's something in your life that you can handle, and it's, it's your emotions. Uh, address some troubled areas and non-conflict times. Honestly, weekends like this when our kids are away for a day or two, we get the chance not only to date and to enjoy that, but we'll work through some stuff that we couldn't work through when the kids are in the house. Are you there, everybody? We talk about money uh, we, we t we, where we don't talk about that in front of our kids. I grew up in a house. I love my parents. I honor them. Probably watching today. We talked about money too much. And so I was insecure about money coming into our marriage because I saw insecurity and so we don't talk to about that in front of our kids so it gives us a chance over this weekend to talk about how great it was not to have all those Amazon deliveries during the snow you know <laughs> how we really didn't need them Pat <laughs> they're coming back they're co yeah <laughs> <laughs> last thing I didn't put this on the screen but they're playing the slow music you ought to be having fun in your marriage yeah. I, I just think it ought to be fun. I just think it ought to be fun. And I think it ought to be fun because the Bible says it ought to be fun. One of the values of our church, we're a value-driven organization. One of the values of our church is that we choose joy. We choose joy. We don't wait for happiness to tackle us because if you wait for happiness, then events like last week won't overcome you. They'll, 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 they'll aggravate you. They'll, it, it's, it's amazing what will happen in a, just the course of a week with no power, no water, and now there's tension and there's frustration and, and, and money and work and now, and now all this stuff comes up if you wait on circumstances to give you happiness. But we choose joy because joy is based on something on the inside of us, not something happening on the outside. And you need to choose joy in your marriage. You need to be having fun in your marriage. Ecclesiastes 9 and 9, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, who wrote Proverbs. And Ecclesiastes said it like this, live happily with the woman you love. Through all the, I love how he says this, through all the meaningless days of life that God's given you under the sun. I think he's saying just all the normal days, just a normal old Tuesday. Live happy. 
Be happy. Don't come home frustrated and angry. All If you do, Luke, I do this. Brandy knows. She'll text me sometimes, 6, 7 o'clock. Where are you? I'm just looping the neighborhood trying to get happy. <laughs> I just, I got a bunch on me that I don't want to bring in there. And so I'm going to go choose joy before I get in there because I set the tone of my home. And the tone of my marriage. And I want to live happily with the woman God gave me. The wife God gives you is your reward, everybody. All the women said amen. <laughs> if you don't have any romance, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I hope your kids are gone. I waited all, all the whole message. So this is your fault if you're still here. Without romance and sex, you're just business partners and you're shacking up living together. And you didn't marry a business partner. You married a spouse. There ought to be romance and fun and sex and come on somebody. It ought to be an exciting time. And if it's not, they're going to find excitement somewhere. And I'm not excusing bad behavior. I'm just telling you, if you don't create happiness in your home, they'll find it somewhere. You can fight fair. You can fight fair. I think, um, real quickly, what happiness is... It's different for everyone, but yesterday, we, we love to be alone and, and no kids, but we called a few couples in the church and yeah. went to lunch, yeah. and um, I think, you know, being around people, and, and this is kind of with our Stuck Together series, find people who give you life, who you can laugh with, you feel safe with, who are going to lift you. Um, that's just as important as, as, as sex and, and finding romance, which we love, but yes, it's important. <laughs> Amen. I made him, I, I told him, please don't do that to me. <laughs> but it's so important to find and to surround your, your marriage and you as a couple with like-minded people. And if, if you're doing this on Sunday, but during the week you're with uh, coworkers or, right. you know, people that aren't serving God and are, and are in turmoil and are constantly, it's not going to work. Right. You, you have to find people, your tribe, your people your crew that are going to come around you and encourage you that you do have fun with. We, you have to have fun. And I think that's something that the, the last year has sucked out right. um, just because we've been so focused on we just have to get through this day. We just have to check this box. We just have to finish this. And you really, really need to take the time to enjoy one another. That is what it, that's, that's what it was designed for. Yep. It should be a safe place, a place where you can relax, a place where you can be open and honest and, and all your weird eccentricities, all the things that other people you would die if they knew. This is supposed to be a safe place to know those things. And and having fun takes the edge off of that. And it's it's so, so important. So good. Last thing, conflict is inevitable. But healing is healing possible. Is possible. Conflict is inevitable, but healing is possible. And that's my prayer for you today. Grab your spouse by the hand. If you came to church with somebody else, grab them by the hand. Not if you're married, though. Don't. Let me clarify. How about mess some of y'all up? If you're single, don't be creepy. <laughs> I know we. I, I, didn't Brandy do a great job today? I know we've. I know we now take their hand. I know we've laughed, um, but it's true. We just live in such a tense world. Man, tensions are so high. Had a conversation this morning with a dream teamer, member of our team, about attention in, in another family. And it's just hard. The world's hard right now. And and look at my eyes. I want to be the voice of hope for you, but it's going to get worse. Everybody, let me I I, I don't know if I've said this enough. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says the love of many will wax cold. It's waxing cold out there. It's getting dark out there. And we're going to have to fight fair. We're going to have to love well. We're going to have to stand with each other. Marriages are going to have to stand. Churches are going to have to stand. I refuse to let the devil divide our church. I, we, we have a, no, a zero tolerance policy against gossip and drama. If you're looking for that in this church, I got a list of good churches you could go to. They love that stuff. 
I can't stand it. I will not give the devil a foothold in this church to divide us. We are one. Say amen to that, everybody. And it starts right here. It starts right here. Come on, bow your heads. Let me pray. Father, I pray for every couple in the room today. God, I pray for people maybe in fighting and argument and tension right now. God, I pray. I pray for couples that the devil use this last year to divide I hate the devil I hate what he's done this past year I hate the conflict I hate the cancel culture I hate the I hate the the tension that has risen I hate the arrogance of social media I hate the I hate the division that it's caused. I hate it and I hate what it's done to couples and marriages. And I rebuke it in Jesus' name from this church. I rebuke it off of these families and these couples and these marriages. I pray for healing today. Come on, receive the healing of the Lord. Single adults, receive healing. Go into your marriage. Go into a relationship with tools. Do better. Do better. Learn better. Learn how to communicate. 50, 60-year-old men. Come on, men. Use your words. Let's listen. Let's, let's use our words carefully. Let's be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. Now, this is the part only you can pray. God, forgive me for all the times I've messed this up. God, Brandy's been faithful for 21 years when I have messed a lot of this up. A lot of times I've caused it. It's my fault. I repent to God. I repent to Brandy. God, I pray for healing over some wounds that I've caused. Come on, you can say that to God too. I, I repent for the times I've said too much, didn't say enough, didn't listen when I should, the times I had contempt and disgust on my face, and the times that I just thought about what I would say next. I, I, God, I repent. God, I, I pray for a spirit of love and romance, and communication and healing in this church, healing in every relationship and every marriage. Now with your head still bowed and your eyes closed, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, no marriage, no relationship, no life works really until Jesus is at the center. I don't know how else to tell you that. I, I, I've said it to every counseling I've ever done and every couple. If Jesus isn't the center, it's not going to work. It's just, it may you may put a Band-Aid on it for a little bit, but you need God in, in your marriage, in your relationship. So if you've never surrendered or you're ready to do it again, just ask Him, Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you that it provides healing and deliverance for all of my sin and brokenness. God, I pray for healing today. God, I ask you to forgive me. Be the Lord of our lives, the Lord of our marriage, the Lord of my relationships let me pray for divorced couples I feel led by the Holy Spirit to pray for you if you if you if there's divorce in your past and and you feel ashamed or guilt don't feel it that's not from God I don't care what anybody else told you listen to me the past is in the past put it under the blood and let's move on in Jesus name father I pray for healing against guilt and shame for broken relationships God, I pray a new day starts today, healing going forward, that love can come again, trust can come again, hope can be restored, that it can be better. Pray for couples on the edge, ready to give up, that they recommit, try again, back up, let's go, let's go all in again, let's do our best. Not 50-50, but 100% from both of us, we're going to do our best. God, I thank you that you're our healer, not just of our bodies but of our marriages and our relationships and our minds and our emotions. I receive that healing today. Come on, tell him that I receive it. We receive it afresh. We receive your forgiveness. We receive your grace and mercy again. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody shout amen.